I want to invite you to turn to John's Gospel this morning. I'm going to press pause here in our study through the book of Mark, and we'll be back there next week, Lord willing. But today we're in John chapter 1, and uh, you've already heard this morning from Matthew's Gospel and from Luke's Gospel, uh, just this telling of the story of the Lord's birth. And, and, and we're, we're familiar with those passages of Scripture. We, we hear them um, every year, this time of year, uh, probably several times, and we think on those wonderful events that surrounded the Lord's birth. And while Matthew and Luke focus more on kind of the historical events that surrounded the Lord's birth, Here's what happened, and here's what order it happened in. Here's the angels coming and declaring that the Lord is going to be born, and what kind of child he's going to be. And you can read more in Luke, and you can read more about that in some of these other prophecies that were given even to other people, and the ways that God was working to, to bring all this to pass. And we read the story about them going to Bethlehem for that taxing, that registration, the census, so that uh, they could be counted and pay their dues to Rome and you read that the time came for the baby to be born and all those things that unfolded, angels singing in the fields to shepherds and all of that. So you get all this historical account and what a wonderful, beautiful, miraculous story it is. But John takes a little bit of a different approach when he thinks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if I can use this term, I, I suppose he takes a little bit more of a theological approach. And that's not to say there's not a ton of good Bible doctrine to be found in what we read in Matthew and in Luke, we learn so many things there. We see the fulfillment of so many prophecies, so many things that can give us confidence in the Lord's promises and what he said long ago and is bringing to pass in the birth of the Lord Jesus. But while those gospels kind of tell us what happened, John tends to focus a little bit on the significance of those events and what they mean for us from a little bit more of a theological sort of perspective. What did it mean? For Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, what would he accomplish when he came into the world? And so we're going to be in John's gospel this morning, considering this, we're going to be looking at the first 18 verses there, as we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus, what has God done for us in sending his son? We're in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and if you're able, I would invite you to stand as we read these words. This is another passage of scripture that you're going to be familiar with, but let's read together the word of the Lord. John writes, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from John whose name was or sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. 
We'll stop there. You can be seated. Father in heaven, what a privilege to gather and worship with your people. Week in and week out when we come together on the Lord's day. And God, we acknowledge that there's no real difference between this worship service and any other worship service that we come to on this Sunday morning. We gather weekly in honor of you. And yet we know that today is special as we celebrate the Lord's birth, as we remember how you stepped into our world so that you could bring us salvation. And so God, as we gather this morning, and God, as we gather in our homes and with loved ones throughout this day, and there have already been celebrations that have already been had, and there are, I'm sure, celebrations that are yet to come, Lord, I pray that we would not lose sight of the significance of this day, that we would not lose sight of the importance of the Christ, of Christmas, that we would not miss what it means for Jesus to come into this world. God, we rejoice that we have the opportunity to gather and worship today. We know that there are many who are not worshiping this morning for any number of reasons, and uh, that's not for us to be too concerned with. God, we know there are many who, though, would desire to be with your people who can't be, uh, whether that be because of weather situations and difficulties in travel on the roads, because of damage to facilities that I've heard about in different places, people who wanted to gather but can't because their buildings are cold and flooded, and brothers and sisters around the world. God, believers who long for an opportunity just to be with someone else who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus, and yet there's no one else they know. God, we pray that you would be with every one of them, that they would know your mercies today, that they would celebrate this season with great joy as they remember the Christ who came to us on Christmas. And God, as we look to your word this morning, I pray that you would guide us that you would teach us, God, that you might convict us and move upon us in ways that we need you to do that, God, that you would help us to rejoice in the great gift that we celebrate today. Oh, we pray that you're honored in all of it, and that our lives today and always will be lived for the glory of your name. We pray in the name of Christ, amen. In the opening words of his gospel, John's really laying a foundation for everything that's going to come in his gospel. If you, you've studied it much, you see that, that what he's giving us here in this prologue is really just um, laying out these fundamental truths that are going to be built on throughout the story of his gospel. When you come to the end of God, John's gospel, you see he writes that if he were to try to write down everything that Jesus had done, there's no way that the world could be able to contain the books that would be written uh, there's more than could possibly ever be told. But he does say in chapter 20, verse 31, that what he has written down has been written for this purpose, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Every word of this gospel, John says, is this, so that you can know the truth about who Jesus is and that you can be transformed by that truth, that you can become someone who is made new and that by believing these things, by trusting in the Lord Jesus, you will have life in his name. And while John begins his gospel differently than what we might see in Matthew and in Luke, we are being told the story of the Lord's birth. And we're being told the significance of the Lord's birth, the importance of his coming into the world. And we are told with absolute clarity, lest there be any mistake, who this child is and what he's come to accomplish and how we ought to respond to him. John wants us to know the truth about Jesus, that he is the Christ, 
the long-awaited promised Messiah, the deliverer of God's people, and that he is the Son of God. And he wants that knowledge to lead to our salvation. And so not just knowing something about Jesus, but having true knowledge of Jesus that leads to saving faith and eternal life. Now the passage that we've read this morning that opens this gospel lays the foundation for all of that. In these words, John is helping us to understand the the real meaning, the real purpose of the incarnation and what it meant for Jesus to be born and to enter into this world He's telling us what lies at the heart of this Christmas story. So as we gather today in celebration of the Lord's birth, I pray the Lord would just guide us here and that he would help us to understand fully the miracle of the incarnation. And so I kind of want to just walk through this passage of Scripture and and think a few things through. And I think there are three primary truths that we're going to find here when we consider uh, this, this miracle of the incarnation. Three things we're going to find here that we all must know And that ultimately we all must believe if we are to know Christ as he is and if we are to have life in his name. And so three things I want us to see as we look through this text, thinking in light of the Lord's birth, his coming into the world, which is exactly what John is telling us about here. What does it all mean? Three truths for us to draw from here. The first is this, that the newborn king of Christmas was and is eternal God. The newborn king of Christmas was and is eternal God. Look again there at verse 1. We read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In those five verses there, John is stressing this very important truth that the Christ child of Christmas is the eternal God. Not that he is like God. Not that he resembles God. Not that he makes a good representative of God. Not that he points people to God. Not that he has knowledge of God but that he, in fact, is God. And he shows this in several ways. Now, he starts by making a very important statement that we might be tempted to look over. He opens this gospel with three words. What are they? In the beginning. Well, we read that somewhere once before, right? Go to the beginning of the book, right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, what do we read? In the beginning. And who was there in the beginning? It was God. In the beginning, God. And here we see again, in the beginning, the Word. So we we have this, this reference here to Christ speaking of him just the same way that the Bible speaks of eternal God. The one who was there from the start, who put this universe together by the power of his Word, who put together this world and put us in this world The one who was there doing all of that is the one he's speaking of here in his gospel as he proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. He is pointing us to the fact that Jesus Christ, the one born in Bethlehem, is the eternal God in both his existence and in his work. And he fleshes that out a little bit, and he he says something pretty interesting here. He says, in the beginning was the word. Now, he's not being maybe crystal clear here in this exact moment, but as you read on, it becomes abundantly clear. He's giving testimony about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he refers to Jesus as the Word. He's using a Greek word. You probably know it. The word is logos. It's a word that's important, though, to both the Greeks and to the Jews in his day. I want us to understand when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and he's going to tell us about this Word and all that he has accomplished as he tells us about this word, a word with great significance. In Greek philosophy, the logos represented the rational principle that would govern all things. And that sounds very intellectual, but what it basically means is this, that the word, the logos, is the reason and the purpose 
behind all things. It is the thing that helps us to understand everything else. It is the thing that gives other things importance. The Logos is everything. And so we're told here, as he's speaking about Christ, and he's referring to him as the Word, what is he saying? That Jesus is the one who is ultimately behind all of this. He is the reason behind all things. He is the purpose and driving force for all of life. And what that means is that it is only through knowing and understanding the reality of who Jesus is that you can really know and understand anything else. So think about that. If you don't know Christ, you're you're never really going to understand all that's going on in this world around you. How many of you can testify to that today? Apart from knowledge of the gospel, apart from the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, if we didn't understand this, who is this Jesus? None of this world would make much sense, right? And so there is meaning, there is purpose given to our lives in this world because of that word, that logos. And so he says to those who understood the Greek philosophy of the day that Jesus is the underlying purpose and power behind all things. He is the one who rules over it all. He's been there from the beginning. He holds all of it together, and Scripture testifies to that. In the beginning was the Word. You can't make sense of this world apart from Christ. That's what the Logos meant to the Greeks, but to the Jews, it it represented something more. For the Jews, the Logos represented the creative Word of God. Now, I think you take that again. Let's look at that in context of Genesis chapter 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what do we see? God spoke. He said, let there be. And what happened? It was. God says, light. And there's light. God says land, and there's land. He says water, and there's water. He says creatures of all sorts, and those creatures come to being. God speaks, and things happen. This Logos, it's the creative word of God that brings all things into being. Psalm 33, verse 6 says this, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. That's the meaning of the Logos of God for the Jews. So if John says to them, that Look, in the beginning was this word, and that word is Christ. What is he saying? Jesus is himself the eternal God, the creator of all things, the powerful word of God that brings all things to pass. This newborn king, born in Bethlehem, is eternal God. He goes on to say there that the word was with God and the word was God. Lest you're not understanding what I'm laying down here, he's the one who was there in the beginning, He's the one that gives meaning and purpose to all of life. He's the creative power that has brought all this into being and continues to hold it all together. If you're not getting it yet, let me say this to you. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was with God in eternity past. And Jesus was God in eternity past. There's a nod here to a biblical understanding of the Trinity. You have this representation of the Father and of the Son. Though separate in person from God the Father, we're told that Jesus is still one with God the Father. He was there in the beginning with God. He was God. Not a creation of God. But as a matter of fact, the Creator God. God the Father did not create Jesus the Son. He was always there. He was with God, and he was God. And then John basically restates what he's already said there, beginning in verse 4. Going going, going into more details, he says, or or beginning in verse 2, the next four verses, he says there, he was in the beginning with God. Again, don't miss this. He was there from the start. In the beginning was the Word. He was in the beginning with God. So don't miss this. This is the God who's always been. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that has been made. Do you have any question about the the power behind all of creation that's come into being? What is the spoken word of God that brings all that to pass? It's Jesus. He's the one who causes all these things to be. What are we told? That in him we live and move and have our being, right? He is the creator 
who has made all things, and without him was not anything made that has been made. You can't separate Christ from the eternal creator of the universe. He wants to make it very clear, this Jesus, he is eternal God. That's a very important question for us to be able to answer, a great question of our day, because a lot of people don't quite understand this. They, they can't wrap their minds around this. They, they can't believe this. They don't want to believe this because it would come with a lot of consequences. There are many historians who will admit that there was a real figure in history, a man named Jesus who had an impact for sure, but they think that most of the stories about him have been made up. There are many who believe that Jesus was a prophet. Even people who would, would consider the idea of him being the Messiah to be blasphemy will still say, yes, he's a prophet who came from God, one who displayed the power of God. You're not going to find a lot of people who are not willing to admit that Jesus was a very good man. Helped a lot of people, did a lot of nice things, taught some good stuff. If we listen to him, the world would be a better place. They'll say that Jesus was a good man, but it is uniquely Christian to believe that Jesus is the God-man. And the world takes offense to this message. They don't, they don't like to hear this. They will happily accept, many of them at least, a God. Perhaps even a God who is creator of the universe, but they want him to be hands off. When, when you bring Jesus into the picture and you count him as more than a good man and more than a good teacher, those walls can start to go up. People can get very skittish. And I think a lot of that has to do with what we see in verses 4 and 5. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. And the light shines the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus brought light into a dark world, just as he had done before. He brought light into a dark world, but, but the world couldn't quite understand that. The darkness, sinful human hearts couldn't quite lay hold of that. The ESV uses that word overcome which is acceptable. I think some other translations maybe do it better here. Because I think really this, this idea of the darkness overcoming has to do with comprehension, understanding, being able to grasp the reality of who Jesus is. That's what separates those who are Christian from the rest of the world and from every other faith system. This belief that Jesus is in fact God himself. And what we see in this passage and what we'll see in a whole lot of other places when you read the Bible is that's not something we're able to come to on our own. The darkness can't, can't, can't handle this. Can't wrap his mind around this. He, he comes into the world, but the world doesn't know how to deal with this. Couldn't comprehend. That's why we need mercy from God. That's why we need new birth. But he's making abundantly clear as he lays out this scripture. That Jesus Christ, that newborn king that we celebrate at Christmas, born in Bethlehem, proclaimed by angels, all of these things, he was and he is eternal God. That's the first thing. The second thing that kind of comes to light, and, and, and all of these things are kind of just repeated throughout this text. They come up over and over, and we'll see that as we go. But I think one of the second kind of key truths that comes out of here this thing we need to know about Christmas and the incarnation, this coming of the Lord Jesus, is that this baby who was born in Bethlehem came to be the Savior of the world. This baby born in Bethlehem came to be the Savior of the world. Look at verse 6. We read, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
children who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You picking up on some, some themes here? We begin with this idea that Jesus is the eternal God. He was there in the beginning. He was with God. He was God. Everything was made by him. Nothing made apart from him. And he comes to give light to a dark world that finds itself unable to take hold of him. But not only was he eternal God who came into this world, but he came to be the savior of the world. Now we have John the Apostle who's writing this gospel. But he tells us beginning in verse 6 about a different man named John. Speaking there of John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the Lord. If you read there in Luke's gospel, you get to, to learn some things about his own conception and his own birth. And there was a miracle of God bringing all that to pass as well. And there were prophecies given about the life he was going to live and the things he was going to accomplish. But he was meant to do what? To point people to the Savior who was coming into the world, to tell him, look, this Messiah that you've been waiting for, he's here, and so you better get ready. The kingdom is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel, right? This is John's purpose, to point to the Lord Jesus. He's sent from God. His name is John, and he comes as a witness to bear witness about the light. Again, that all may believe through him. That's this thing that comes up over and over again in John's gospel. He wants people to believe the good news of Christ, and he's not the light. He was clear about that. I'm not the one you're waiting for. There's another one who's coming, so don't be looking at me. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. And verse 9 tells us that that light was coming into the world. Verses 9 through 13, they tell us about this one who would come. He was the true light of the world, we're told. He would come and give light. To every man. He was the creator of the world who would come into the world, even though that world would reject him. Again, this, this theme of Jesus as creator coming up again here. He, he came into the world. The world was made through him. But again, the darkness couldn't overcome. The darkness couldn't comprehend. The darkness couldn't take hold of this light. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But for those who would receive them, he says, to those who would believe in his name, he gave them what? He gave them the right to become children of God. The right to become children of God. And how does he say that happens? Be a good person. Say the right words. Follow the right steps. Come on up and get in the water. Get your name on a list. Be born in the right family? Be born in the right place? No. To those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Children born how? Not of blood. It's not your family. The faith of your parents is not going to save you. Granddaddy who built this church 100 years ago, he's not going to save you. Not of blood. Nor of the will of the flesh can't do it yourself. You're not strong enough. You can't fix the problem of sin in your heart, no matter how hard you try. Not of the will of man. It's not a matter of willpower. Resolve. How do we become the children of God? By God's mercy alone. Born not of the flesh, not of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. This is a message we see throughout the scripture. We see it in John's gospel. If you go over to John chapter 3, you see it. Nicodemus comes to the Lord Jesus. He's got some questions, right? And Jesus says to him, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. And he goes on to explain that, that we're born once of the flesh in that natural human way. But if we're going to see the kingdom of God, if we're going to become the children of God, we've got to be born again. We've got to be born of the spirit. This is what we call regeneration or the new birth. It takes a move of God to awaken us, to transform us, to give us true knowledge of the gospel that leads us to salvation. And when he does that, we are given that right to become children of God, born of God. Physical birth and spiritual birth. 
But the thing we have to understand here is that, and then this is something John's pointing out here, this can only happen through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sp spiritual birth is a work of God. He, he, he has to put this new life within us. He has to open blind eyes and deaf ears. He has to soften hard hearts and replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And then, of course, it's only those who have received Christ, who believed on his name, that can become the sons and daughters of God. Jesus is what? We read later in John, the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. This light comes into the world to give life to the world. And though the world at large can't overcome that, they can't embrace that, they can't understand or comprehend the mercies of God, it is the mercy of God alone that can bring us to the place where we ever can. And so God transforms us, he renews us, he gives us that new birth, and he shows us the way of salvation that is found only in his son. He is the one who's come to bring light, to bring knowledge of salvation, so that all who would receive him are given the right to become the children of God, born of God. It's a very important message for every one of us, it can be an offensive word, but it is a word that is true nonetheless. And John wants his readers to know this, that Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of our salvation. There is no other way. You won't get to God by being a good person. You can't earn some sort of favor with God through your uh, good living or your practice of religion. You're not going to get there any other way but through faith in the Lord Jesus. What did the angel say to Joseph when he appeared to him? We read it from Matthew this morning. You're going to call his name Jesus. And why are you going to call his name Jesus? Because he's going to do what? He's going to save his people from their sins. And he would accomplish that salvation through the incarnation. Coming into this world, being born into humble circumstances, living a sinless life, and dying his atoning death on the cross for our sake. That's this, this second truth that comes up here in, in, in this John, and it's repeated over and over again throughout this gospel, but we see it here, that Jesus Christ, that child born in Bethlehem, came to be the Savior, and we could say the only Savior, of the world. And we see in the incarnation, in this birth of Christ that we celebrate today, that the virgin-born Emmanuel brought heaven to earth and God to man. Verse 14 says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Again, a nod to the eternality of Jesus. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And he tells us no one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Again, we're looking here at this, this miracle of the incarnation, which is a fancy word basically saying that God became man. He came to us. And John tells us here that this logos, this, this word, this, this, this foundation for all truth and understanding, this creative power of God, this word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we, we, we don't need to look past that too quickly. <laughs> Very important to our understanding of the faith. We're told here that literally, God himself took on human form and came to earth. The eternal God who made all things, who had made the one who would be his mother, stepped into this world. He took on human form. Creator stepping down into creation, the king of universe, making himself a simple citizen of this planet Earth. God became man. He took on human flesh. It says literally there, he came and he dwelt among us. 
That, that word refers to the tabernacle. He came and set up his dwelling place with us. He, 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 he put up a tent, a place where he could live for a little while. He set up his dwelling place with us. There's reference here back to the Old Testament, to the tabernacle. You know the significance of the tabernacle, right? I mean, God creates this world, but pretty quickly things get broken. And so that fellowship that was had, that intimate fellowship with God freely and openly in the garden is removed here. They're cast from the garden. There's guards put in place so they'll never again enter into that place. And we see this perfection, this, this wonderful life, always in the presence of God. It gets wrecked and everything's a mess. Through sin entering the world, this fall, everything gets messed up. But God is always promising there's a redemption that's coming. And he makes his promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Joseph. And you have all these, these things that are unfolding here, these promises of things that are yet to come. You have that story of Joseph who gets sent off to slavery in Egypt. And you know the story there of the, the exodus and all that goes along with that. After Joseph and his family prosper there, a new Pharaoh rises who's afraid of them and he enslaves all the Hebrew children and God sends Moses to go and set the people free. And God works in miraculous ways to bring them out into the wilderness. But while they're there in exile on this way to the land that God has promised to them, God gives them some instructions. And he says, I want you to build a tabernacle. I want you to set up a place for me to dwell. And so they build this tabernacle. And when they want to meet with the Lord, what do they do? That's where they go. And they go there and they offer sacrifices. And they go there and they meet with the Lord. And you see this happen for a while where the presence of God is there in the tabernacle. Later they'll build the temple in Jerusalem. But you have this place. You want to see God. You want to know God. That's where you're going to go and that's where you're going to meet him. And then comes Jesus. All these people who, who couldn't get to the temple. Who couldn't come near to the tabernacle. Those times when they were cast back into slavery and scattered out all over the place and their temple was destroyed, how will we ever know our God? Well, he's coming to be with you. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. He sets up his tabernacle, his temple, in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus becomes the presence of God on the earth, in the flesh, living and breathing, walking among his people. And he makes so very, very clear that that's exactly who he is. You see here, he says that he came and dwelt among us and we've seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, they knew this to be true. They'd been there. They'd seen it. We're, we're in Mark's gospel, working our way through that for several months now. And what are we seeing? He's just living among his people and walking among them and demonstrating day in and day out the power and the glory and the majesty of God and everything that he does. He says, we've seen his glory. The Son of God has been with us. We saw him in the flesh. John told us he was coming. He bore witness about him. He said he's coming, and he's coming after me, but he ranks before me because he was before me. This is the eternal word, the logos of God, God himself. And he steps into the world, and he comes to redeem us from the curse of the law that was given through Moses, and he gives us grace, and he gives us truth. And he says there that no one has seen God. And yet... We have. Because the only God, this is Jesus now, who is at the Father's side, this is after Jesus has died. And, you know, he, he's writing this record at a later time. The only God who's at the Father's side, which is where we know Jesus is now. He's made him known. Because he came. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory of the only God. Jesus has made it all known because he is God and he came to us. Jesus confirms this in John chapter 14, verse 9, when he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The fullness of God's glory on earth in human form. And we're told that from that fullness we have received grace upon grace through Jesus Christ. 
really he's affirming again those first two things we saw that that Jesus this Christ child who's been born he is the eternal God and that this Jesus born in Bethlehem he is the savior of the world And then he stresses again that God took on human form through his birth and made God known to us. He made God known to us by coming to us as God himself. God stepping into this world to save sinful men through Jesus Christ, the Son. The virgin-born Emmanuel brought heaven to earth and God to man. And we sang those words moments ago, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. That was the message proclaimed by the angels, and it's the message that was made clear, abundantly clear to the life of the Lord Jesus through the mighty power on display in his life, the miraculous works, through his obedience to the Father, even to the point of death on the cross. And so the one who made himself nothing, John tells us, is now at the Father's side. But he has made him known to us. Jesus is eternal God. Jesus is our only Savior. Jesus is God with us and we read the stories and you know the angels would say hey he's coming into the world there's going to be a baby and here's all the things he's going to accomplish And, and, and we know that that so many people would hear that story and say oh that sounds great isn't that lovely and there are people today and for weeks before this and probably for weeks after this who will who will read that story and say isn't that wonderful but they'll never really understand these truths. Christmas is about a lot more than a cute little baby in a stable. And we can get so caught up in all the trappings of this season, and even, even those things that have Christian sorts of themes, but so often we miss these realities of the gospel that are so crucial to understanding what this is really all about. And so I pray that we know these things as we go throughout our days and we celebrate with our families as this day goes forward. I hope we're mindful of this. That the manger in Bethlehem was simply a point of entry. We were having this conversation with our kids yesterday and talking about, you know, we're, we're coming to church because it's important for us and we come every Lord's Day, but we're going to come and I think it'll be especially good that we gather with God's people on this day. And one of the kids said, yeah, because it's the most important day of the year. And I said, almost. <laughs> because we know the manger is, is, is a means, right? This is an entry point. This is a way that Jesus chose to lay aside the glories of heaven and to come into this world so that he could get to the cross of Calvary. You know, none of that was a surprise. This wasn't a, oh, whoops, things didn't go very well, let's figure out another way. It's a plan from the beginning. The manger was a means to get to the cross. And so with the birth of the Christ child, eternal God stepped into this world to save us. He set up his dwelling place among us to be with us so that we could know him. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, even though he is now in heaven at the right hand of his Father, the Spirit that he has sent forward to guide us to all truth and to teach us the things that he taught his disciples when he was here, that Spirit is still God's presence coming to us, abiding with us day in, and day out. And so by his spirit, we know him. He makes himself known to us. And you think about that at the Lord's death, that veil in the temple was torn, right? No more wall of separation. The word became flesh. And even when he departed, he would send his spirit. And he is with us always. And so as you celebrate with your family, when we 
I, I just pray that you can rejoice in those truths. As we sing these songs, as we share in gifts and, and meals and all these sorts of things, let's not lose sight of what we celebrate. The eternal God has come to us and he dwells with us. And one day he's coming again so that we'll be with him bodily in his presence to receive all of his blessings and all of his glory forever. But this is a gift that's only for those who believe and who have life in his name. I pray that you know him, that you have heard the call of the gospel, and that you have come to Jesus with repentance and faith. If not, I pray that you do that. But for the rest of us, can we just rejoice? Emmanuel has come, and he is with us, and we will be with him for all eternity because eternal God stepped into this world to save. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice in the great gift, the greatest of all gifts that you've given to us and your son, Jesus Christ. Eternal God stepped into the world to seek and to save those who were lost and to make his dwelling place among us Literally, physically, bodily for a time, and now in spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, you have come to us when we were lost, when we were dead, and you have given us life through the Christ child who went to the cross. God, I pray that we know your mercy, that we embrace your mercy that we believe this gospel, that it is true, and that by believing, we have life. Thank you for giving us life in Jesus Christ. And for those who have not yet experienced that, God, would you work even now to bring new birth, to give life, to give people the right to become the children of God, born of God. God be with us as we celebrate. I pray that this day would just be a day of great rejoicing as we come before you, even as we gather with family and friends. Help us as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles to teach our children, God, to show them the real hope that comes through the Christ. And God, let the power of the gospel prevail in our lives and in their lives as we hold out that truth before them. We rejoice in God our Savior who has come to us. So God, help us to rejoice and help us to proclaim that the King has come and that he's coming again. Thank you so much for loving us, for sending your Son for us, for saving us through your mercy. Help us to give you glory always for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, it has been good to gather. It is good to see you here. It's a beautiful sight to be able to look on this crowd on this day. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas with your family and your friends. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.